Aloha, Inspired Money Makers. I'm Andy, your host and financial advisor at Running Mead Capital Management. Welcome back to Inspired Money, the live stream podcast. Today, we're talking about one of my favorite subjects that's unleashing the power of compound interest, also called compound growth, if you, would, if you, would, if you apply it to stocks or real estate. So why is it that I want to dedicate an entire episode to this subject. The concept of compounding your money is foundational to investing and growing your wealth. Often hailed as the eighth wonder of the world, the magic of compound interest lies in its simplicity and its extraordinary ability to grow wealth over time. It's one of the first concepts that my father taught me when I joined Runnymede Capital Management 25 years ago. The importance of identifying a great company with consistent earnings growth and then buying a group of those company stocks over the long term as a core holding. If you don't know my dad, maybe you'll trust somebody like Warren Buffett, who once said, my wealth has come from a combination of living in America, some lucky genes and compound interest and a nod to Vice Chairman of Berkshire Hathaway and longtime friend of Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, who died yesterday at age 99. He once said, understanding both the power of compound interest and the difficulty of getting it is the heart and soul of understanding a lot of things. Charlie Munger was blessed to live 99 years. That's a very long time to experience and enjoy compound interest. So in this episode, we have a fantastic group of panelists. Let's welcome them in. We have a couple of familiar faces. Let me start with Mariko Gordon, founder of Daruma Capital Management and a trailblazer for women of color and finance. She conquered the highs of a Lincoln Center keynote in 2014 and weathered the lows of closing her business in 2019. Today, she empowers women in business, provides financial planning and consulting services, and serves as treasurer of the Asian American Writers Workshop. Mariko, welcome back. Thank you. Tell Andy. us about your new firm, because you are now a registered investment advisor. Yes, I um, tried to, you know, tried to walk away. <laughs> I couldn't. Um, so now instead of having an institutional money management firm, my um, RIA is Uzume because I love naming companies after unpronounceable Japanese <laughs> icons. And um, I now manage money for, for individuals rather than institutions. So it's, a, it's different, but it's just you can't, I guess you can take the girl off of Wall Street, but you can't take Wall Street out of the girl. <laughs> you know I, I like that. I know that you're going to excel whether you are doing institutional management or working with individuals. We have Helene Olson. She's an award-winning Washington Post opinion writer and expert on money and society. She's author of Pound Foolish and co-author of The Index Card. She's appeared on The Daily Show, Frontline, the BBC, and many other places. She was recognized as one of Business Insider's 50 women who are changing the world. Helene, welcome. You've covered personal finance for quite a long time. Why do you think it is that people continue to struggle, in your opinion? Well, I think there's there's two different things going on. Um, and hi, by the way, thank you for having me on. I should start by saying that. Um, you know, I think first we live in a country where a lot of people actually don't earn as much as they need. Um, you know, there's a long held observation that somebody once said to me in such a wonderful way that I always want to give credit that, you know, it's in the United States, it's the inexpensive, it's the, the luxuries that are cheap and the necessities that are expensive. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the cost of it, you know, we have this idea that people are going bankrupt because they go to Starbucks too often. And in fact, it's the cost of housing, it's the cost of education, it's the cost of health care, it's the cost of getting a car and keeping it running, um, and, and so on and so forth. So I think that's a huge, huge component. But I also think, and I think it's something that has been exacerbated, frankly, in the age of social media to some extent, 
that, you know, there's always this sort of, you know, upgra upgrading is probably not the right word, but, you know, ratcheting up of what we consider a baseline. Um, and, you know, so, you know, it's not just, you know, first it was, you know, a hundred person wedding, and then it was a, you know, 150 person wedding, and then it's a destination wedding and everybody's expected to pay to go for four days. And if you don't do it, there's something wrong with you. Um, you know, like you're a terrible friend. And I think that contributes to stuff too. Um, and I, and I think we have to be honest about both of, both of that, both of those roles in all of this. Well, I'm excited to have you here. Thanks for joining. I'm glad that you made it after your lunch. <laughs> oh, thank you. I mean, so everybody knows I'm on the West Coast these days. So I had told somebody I'd meet them for lunch a half hour from my house and it's LA traffic. And I was like, I think I could be back by three. <laughs> perfect, perfect timing. So we've got Jordan Grummet, who found his calling as a physician after his oncologist father's untimely death, shaping his unique perspective on wealth and financial independence. He's an award-winning podcast host of Earn and Invest and author of Taking Stock. He seamlessly combines medical experience with financial acumen, offering insights on life, wealth, and regret-free living. So Jordan, it's so good to have you back. I guess many doctors as a generalization, I think enjoy investing, often tinkering too much, sometimes to their detriment. Do you think investing is the easy or hard part of all of this? Well, it's funny, you know, there's this rumor that doctors are bad business people, and it's actually not true. There's lots of very successful doctors, especially when I first started practicing, who owned their own practices, they owned the real estate where their practice was set it, settled, and then they were making money in all sorts of ways. Um, I think that the investing and managing your money is easy, but because we're physicians and we have all sorts of education, we think we know everything. So there's this habit of jumping in without doing the research and making sure you know what you're doing first. And I think that's what really gets people in trouble. And then we've got Michael Gayed, publisher of the Lead Lag Report and portfolio manager at Title Financial Group. He's a renowned ETF uh, he's renowned for his ETF-focused research and investment strategies. He's authored five award-winning research papers and has appeared on CNBC, Bloomberg, Fox Business, and other outlets. Michael, you're here for, I think, 20 minutes. So we're going to try to get the most we can out of you. Uh, and only because, uh, uh, to Helene's point, it costs a lot of money to... Uh, own a house, buy a house, and it costs a lot of money for weddings. So I have to get busy making more money uh, <laughs> after the 6.30 p.m. Eastern time. But I appreciate it. Sorry for being a bit later. No worries. I did get to see a tweet of a video of your dad at a blackboard back from the mid-90s. That was really cool. Yeah, it was uh, mid-1980s. Uh, if anybody would remember what a VHS tape is. And now I'm at the age where it's like, you know, I feel like only above 40 do people realize what a VHS tape is, but I found this video of my father um, doing a class to Merrill Lynch brokers on an introduction to tech analysis. Uh, I got that converted and then I basically keep on reposting that on social media because it's not only is it a good, good memory for me, uh, but some things never change. Uh, and as much as it's a very dated video, uh, it's just a reminder of how uh, cycles are still a thing no matter what technological era you're in. Yes, absolutely. It's all about the cycles. So I'm glad that all of our panelists are here. Let's jump into seg segment one. Compound interest, often hailed as the eighth wonder of the world, works like a financial alchemist, transforming your initial investment, the principal, into a burgeoning treasure over time. Here's how it works. You start with a sum of money. This amount grows annually at a certain percentage, known as the interest rate or compound growth rate. But unlike simple interest, compound interest reinvests the earnings, adding them back to the principal. This increased sum then earns more interest, creating a cycle of exponential growth. As time marches on, this compounding effect accelerates, much like a snowball rolling downhill, gathering mass. It's this phenomenon that can turn modest savings into substantial wealth, showcasing the potent power of patience and time 
in the realm of finance. Helene, you and Professor Harold Pollack wrote the book, The Index Card, Why Personal Finance Doesn't Have to Be Complicated. Where does compound interest rank when summarizing the most important personal finance advice on the back of an index card? It's pretty high up there. I forget where we actually had it, or I should say Harold put it, but it's fairly high up there. I mean, the idea is, of course, is that over time money grows, right? So, and the longer it has to grow, the bet the more it will grow. Because presumably, I mean, it's never a hundred percent, right? You know, there's always we, you know, there's always this idea the stock market grows X percent every year over time, and that's been true for a hundred years. But I'm always reminding people that can end at any point, right? So you have to put money aside, right? You have to know that. But at the same time, you know, the longer you have, the more likely it is to grow. And so, you know, one of the things that I, I think one of the things I think we all find so frustrating sometimes is, the, you know, the most valuable time to get you know, money aside is the younger you are, you know, in your early 20s, in your late 20s, in your early 30s, say. And of course, that is the time, I won't say you have the most expenses because you think you have the most expenses, but you don't. Um, you know, but it's the time when you don't totally, A, realize the value of putting that money aside. Second, it's the first time usually you have money at your disposal, aside from like your parents' allowance, right? And third, you know, when you're 25, it all seems like it's going to last forever. So there's this sort of like, oh, I want this or I need to do that. And it's kind of a hard thing to understand and explain that you know, this is actually the best time to put that money aside because this way you won't have to put as much money aside when you're 40, say, if you have X goal that you want to meet. Absolutely. Jordan, last time you were here, you said the pitfall is worrying about being perfect when all you need to do is be good or even average by buying reasonable investments with low fees over long periods of time, that's the way that we're going to have so many millionaires and multimillionaires that we might not know what to do with them. <laughs> Can you talk about like the difference between simple interest and compound interest? Well, certainly. I mean, what we're talking about is the difference of linear growth versus exponential growth. When we're talking about compound interest, basically it's the interest you're making off your interest, right? The minute you collect that interest, it's no longer interest. It's now principal. So the idea is we want our money to do the heavy lifting for us. Sweat equity is great. It's great to work hard and make money, but I like the kind of equity that doesn't require us to sweat. I like to put it into the bank, put it into investments and watch those investments grow and let the money do the hard work and not us. And that's why we need this exponential growth, because if we have linear growth, it's just not going to grow fast enough. But if we have exponential growth, that's where we see like the rule of 72, right? This idea that based on what percentage we make on the money, we can multiply that by the number of years and we get the doubling time let that money work for you. It's incredibly strong. In fact, in a lot of ways, it's stronger than we are. Right. So trying to figure out how long will it take for you to double your money? What rate of return do you need to achieve that? Michael, it seems like when it comes to the topic of compound growth, sometimes it's simplified. It's like, oh, you just invest and it's going to grow while you're sleeping. You... you you're keen on risk on, risk off. Can you talk about managing to avoid large losses and how that plays into the process of compounding? So first of all, just to be uh, clear, I, I, obviously Helena is right on the point about when you're young, you feel like it's going to last forever. So spend and don't worry about investing. I do think part of the discussion, and then I'll get into the risk on, risk off, is uh, should be focused around the idea of guaranteed compound interest versus uncertain compound interest. Okay, And what I mean by that is uh, not getting a guaranteed rate of return by investing in treasury bills or money markets or CDs, but the guaranteed rate of return of not paying the compound interest from credit card debt. Okay? So I, I, I often feel, and I think unfortunately in this environment, more and more, I think, young people, traders that are entering the marketplace 
uh, believe they can compound gains and take the chance by leveraging into equity markets, using derivatives, using leverage, uh, when they should probably be paying off that 23% you know, credit card balance on uh, on average, right? The guaranteed company of not having to pay that is really important. Um, now, on the drawdown point, you know, on this, the, it is true that, yes, equities do tend to have positive annualized returns, but the path with which it plays out is critical. And to the extent that you can try to minimize large drawdowns, obviously easier said than done. Being down less ends up resulting in most people being up more. Last two years, as you know, has been challenging for that because if you try to avoid uh, a drawdown in stocks, the classic place that most younger people invest, by doing that in bonds, good luck. You know, you know having a bigger drawdown in bonds than stocks. The last two years, I think, have been abnormal. So from my perspective, uh, in general, the best way to compound in any kind of uh, uh, money uh, is by investing in something which already has had a drawdown. You're much more likely to avoid a drawdown after one has already taken place. Uh, and I think if investors, no matter what age, have that mindset, that's how they're going to win longer term. Mariko, as an investment manager and business coach, how do you explain compound growth to the people that you're working with? Um, well, I think there's, you know, usually a diagram is a really good way of, of, of showing it. So if you look at linear growth, um, to Doc G's point, you know, you're just going to grow a little bit. And when you look at, at compound growth, you have this parabolic kind of curve. Um, and the, the sums are so big that people pay attention. Um, I think though there's a lot of psychology and I know we're gonna to touch on this too and, and Helene, you touched on that as well, that gets in the way of, of people see that and go, wow, but they still <laughs> don't realize, right? The power and we're all born with time. This is the thing, nobody has an edge, right? We have a certain amount of time and no matter where you are, where you come from, you have the power of time that you can harness. And like, this is the biggest leveling, level playing field where people don't understand that. And I actually have, if you, if you bear with me, I have um, the psychology money by Morgan Housel. And since, you know, Charlie, we were talking about Charlie Munger and, and Warren Buffett, he gives this example that Buffett had started investing when he was 10. And of course, you know, he's well in his nineties. By the time he was 30, he had a net worth of a million dollars, which is about 9.3 million today, adjusted for inflation. If he had started at age 30 and retired at age 60 with the same returns, 22% annual compounded growth rate, right? The, he, the difference, listen to this difference, by starting at age 10 and going on until his 90s versus starting at 30 and stopping at 60, it's a difference between $84.5 billion and $11.9 million. Mm -hmm. Okay, so part so the point that that Housel makes is a lot of Buffett's growth. Yes, twenty two percent compounding is amazing, but you know what? It's the decades and decades of time that really make the difference, and those decades are available to anybody who's who's younger. And you know, I think we all wish that we were, you know, when we were young, we had the wisdom that we've acquired through all the sort of you know difficult life experiences we've had. <laughs> And so it's kind of as an elder, you kind of want to sort of get, grab all the 20 year olds and go like, no, really, really believe me. <laughs> I just want to pipe up and say, I have two kids in my twenties so, and their twenties. So I know exactly what you're talking about on a very deep level. Um, <laughs> I sometimes have been known to actually take the example of something someone has bought or is thinking of buying and saying, you see this $300 purchase? Like this could be like a thousand dollars in like thirty years. <laughs> Do you want to give that up? <laughs> yeah, there's an opportunity cost because um, Shelby Davis, a very well known money manager and philanthropist, he was at the Bank of New York when my father was there in the 1970s and 80s. And my father tells me stories about how Shelby wore sweaters with holes in the elbows because he wanted every dollar that he could that he could to be invested he didn't really care about his appearance and um, that's a valuable lesson 
So I want to go to segment two. When it comes to wealth accumulation, compound interest emerges as the master weaver, transforming simple threads into a rich financial tapestry. This power is harnessed through various investment vehicles, from the potential growth and appreciation of stocks to the interest earned from bonds or money market funds. Imagine stocks as seeds in a fertile field, growing through dividends and capital gains, nurtured by compound growth. Over time, these seeds bloom into a forest of wealth. Meanwhile, retirement accounts like IRAs and 401ks serve as robust containers that offer tax-deferred growth, steadily filling with the waters of compound interest, preparing you for a secure and prosperous future. As we traverse the landscape of financial growth, remember, whether it's a stock or bond, retirement account or taxable account, the goal is to leverage the powerful force of compound interest to guide us towards our ultimate destination, financial freedom and security. Let's embark on this journey with wisdom and foresight, harnessing the power of compound interest to pave our road to wealth accumulation. All right, so let's talk about investments and let's go to Michael before, so that we can get the most out of him before he has to leave. How should we think about asset classes and diversification in order to take advantage of compound growth? So there's a line I like to say, which is that um, you're not diversified unless you have a portion of your portfolio that you hate. <laughs> because what are you going to hate? The part of your portfolio that's not working, which is the very definition of diversification and non-correlated uh, behavior. Um, look, nobody knows what tomorrow brings, right? What are you ultimately diversifying? You're diversifying different paths, different scenarios with which things could play out. So ideally, you want to have as, as much exposure to as many different future paths. And if you could, probability, probability wise, you know, weight it appropriately, um, which is basically kind of a risk parity kind of concept. Uh, at its core, sort of the idea of having stocks, treasuries, commodities, no matter what cycle you're in, one of them is likely to to do well. Um, I was at a conference maybe 15 years ago, 20 years ago, a while ago. I forget the guy who said it, um, but this person that was on the panel said something along the lines of diversification is a luxury for the rich. And the implication there is you know, the way you get very wealthy is you take a concentrated bet on something, whether it's yourself, your business, an individual stock. The fastest way to make a lot of money also is the fastest way to go broke, right? So I do think that um, if you're going to think about investing and diversification, diversify your actual investments, but concentrate on your own skill set, concentrate on your own self-personal investment outside of putting your money to work, put yourself to work and enhance your skills, compound your own ability to be effective and efficient, uh, because I think that probably is where most people will end up having that luxury. Um, and I will say that the point about time is important when it comes to investing. This isn't really talked about a lot, but I do believe we're entering an age where people are going to be able to live a lot longer, whether it's the weight loss drugs like Ozempic or technology that makes us able to just have longer lives. It, it really is important for people to consider the idea that their retirement age may have to be longer because they're going to live, long, live longer and be able to work more anyway. Um, so if you want to get returns, you got to diversify. If you're going to diversify, you got to have investments that you hate. But uh, if you're going to get wealthy, concentrate on yourself. Thank you for that. I saw the figure that 150 million Americans own stocks, but an estimated 42% of U.S. adults do not. This is a really complex issue. Helene, how do you think that we can actually help more people to move the needle? Well, a lot of this is about, you know, poverty and not having money. This isn't about people who are refusing to buy, you know, stocks for some reason. I mean, I'm sure they're out there, but there aren't very many of them. And one of the ways to do this is, you know, in, in other countries, such as Australia, for instance, you know, workplace retirement contributions by both employer and employee are mandatory, right? They, they just have a policy on this. And we don't have that here. In fact, you don't have to, if you're an employer, you don't have to offer up 
a 401k or, you know, or um, an IRA of any sort to your employees. Um, and, 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 the and the employee in turn does not have to con contribute. Um, this obviously is something that probably needs to be addressed. Um, and there have been various attempts to do it, most of which have not gone very well, though there are now initiatives in some of the states where people who don't have um, workplace retirement plans are offered one through the state. But that's where a lot of the problem is coming in. If you look at the stats, and I'm sorry, if I know you were going to ask this question, I would have looked up the exact number before the conference, before, the, before this uh, call, is that's where the majority of people who don't have stocks are actually coming in at this point. Are these people usually low income who just simply don't have access to a plan at work? Um, you know, the second group to some extent is the lower income self-employed. And it's a similar dynamic in that if you don't have, you know, the second you have to take the step to set up your own retirement account, a certain percentage of people just aren't going to do it. And, and to those are really the areas that you would need to concentrate on to bring this number much higher, in my view. Doc G, as somebody who has been able to achieve early retirement financial freedom how do you manage your stocks versus bonds well again for me first and foremost as helene was talking about this you know it helps me reflect on the fact that i come from a place of very enormous privilege right two professional parents who invested when i was a kid who invested in their own businesses as well as real estate as well as stocks and bonds um, which has given me the ability to go to school, get a good education, have a high paying job as a doctor and save money. Being that I am at what I would call the tail end of my doctor career, because I've slowed down doing that, but I am still making money and my wife at the moment still works, although that may not be forever. Um, it's easy for me to be a little bit more aggressive with my money. So you're talking about asset allocation and knowing that we still have some human capital, we're still making some money and that helps defray some of our spending, uh, it's easy for me to be a little more aggressive in the sense that I can do more equity investing and less bond investing. In the past, I've done real estate investing. I'm not as big on that right now, but I'm able to be a little bit more aggressive with my equities. Now, again, that might be a little bit different than Michael was talking about. I'm a big fan of broad-based index investing. Um, but given the fact that I still have income, it gives me a little bit more space to wait until I protect myself or risk mitigate more with things like bonds and treasuries, et cetera. Yeah, and it goes to the point that Michael was talking about earlier, that if indeed we are going to be living longer, that I think that we, we may have to take more risk. We may need more stocks for longer and we need potential appreciation not just relying on the interest of bonds, for example. You know, it's interesting because you you we take that information, right? But we also compare it to the fact that just by having a portfolio and just by owning stock actually decreases your likelihood of running out of money quite a bit. So on my podcast, I often interview financial advisors, coaches, et cetera, who deal with people who are getting close to retirement and it's not the people who have a portfolio that are really at high risk of running out. It's the people who don't have a portfolio. The people who have a portfolio, the people who understand and have been putting their money in their 401k, et cetera, the likelihood they're going to be okay is much, much higher. These people actually rarely run out of money. Where we have problems, the people who didn't save in the first place or were at a job that didn't save for them. As Helene was talking about, there's a lot of legislative change that could help with that. Um, but those are the people I think who are really struggling. So when we look at these longer time periods, I don't worry about the people who are seeing their financial advisor and have a portfolio and they're worried, you know, they're arguing about, can I withdraw 4% or 3% or 5%? Those are the people I'm not worried about it. It's, it's really the people who don't know what those terms mean and have never been really exposed to long-term investing because we do need a little bit of an aggressive return if we want to even consider this idea of retiring at a reasonable age and then living quite a bit of a post-retirement life. I would also add that I think um, sometimes people do have the means with which to save for retirement, um, but are so risk averse that they make 
bad choices very early on and they're compounding their bad choices. So one of the things I kind of do for fun is a sort of kind of is I go to these sort of free retirement planning dinners and I ask a lot of conf- uncomfortable questions because they're usually just sales pitches for annuities, right? And 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 you have people who are like, oh my, you know, right? Everyone loves the guaranteed income. Anyway, but my point is there was somebody who was a state employee for I don't know, 20 something years. And she said that, you know, she only had like made like 1.75%. Oh, and, and I'm like, you know, I'm pretty sure the state of North Carolina's public retirement system is, you know, if it were that bad, it would be legendary. Like I would have heard it was that, right? It cannot, like after it, so either the number is wrong or if you select an option, like I never want to lose money, you're going to end up with a very low rate of return over 20 years, right? So that just broke my heart because you had somebody, w- you know, who 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 was having money put aside, and who who harnessed the power of time, but either didn't get any advice early on or didn't get the right kind of advice, you know. And she's kind of blaming the system, and I'm like. Mm, about that you know (laughs) and i'm not sure an annuity would solve your problem either sister you know what i mean but but and then that just made me go all right you know this is this is what is sort of part of uh you know doc i know your next book is about purpose in life you know this is kind of like my purpose i said let let me let me talk to you let's 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 you know, this is not complicated. This is not rocket science. We don't have to make it perfect. We don't have to make it complicated, right? But you got to be able to stomach some risk because the riskiest thing you can do is to choose to have no risk, particularly when you have multi-decades ahead of you. That is like, right? So that's the other thing I would add is that and and I've I've had this where where I had somebody else who came in and they had a target date fund you know it was like a, a good target date fund but the target date fund was ten years too early, mm-hmm. you know and I was like, why, <laughs> you know, let's change that puppy up you know that kind of thing so. Um, I think there are a lot of things that have made investing easier, being able to buy fractional shares, except they're on platforms that kind of promote investing as gambling instead of, hey, you can buy fractional shares. You can compound $5 at a time. I mean, that's so powerful, but not if you're buying, you know, meme stocks, right? Not if you're like do, doing that. So it's part of it is is a, so many societal structures are getting us to, to, to spend, to consume. So many of us are like, you know, uh, getting us to to manipulating us into into speculating, not investing, trying to beat the system because this you know, and 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 then our own psychology. Right? So we have a lot of headwinds, and really, but I but I keep coming across stories. So this will be good for segment three: stories of regular people, regular people coming out of a few decades as multimillionaires. Hmm. Mariko, in terms of like retirement account that's tax deferred or a Roth IRA where you pay the tax up front and it can grow tax free versus a taxable account, how does one think about the the prospect of compound growth when it's like should it go into a taxable account or a tax, you know, tax advantaged account? So I, the the problem or the issue that can happen and with people who are super savers is they're going to be paying down their mortgage, even if the rate is very low, or they're going to be putting, you know, they'll be maxing out everything in, in tax deferred accounts, which is great to max out everything tax. But then they end up prepaying things rather than having a, an investment fund. Uh, or, you know, the sort of rainy day fund or an investment fund. And I think it's important to have balance on everything because if you're putting money in an illiquid asset, um, your rate of return, you know, if you can, again, it's different when your mortgage is 7%, it's pretty hard to, you know, get a higher after tax return than that. But, you know, there's, there, there are ways to think about your, the ecosystem of your money. And I think, I think that's important. So the, the good thing about tax deferred accounts is mentally that's mattress money. You're not going to touch. So it's easier to be aggressive if you don't check the balances all the time and make yourself nuts, right? So, so that's good. 
The, the thing that we come across, though, is so if you want to think of the term of asset location, where you want to put things that are taxed higher, say income as opposed to gains in tax deferred accounts, uh, it's a thing that people have a hard time getting their heads around. Right. So then you end up with, you know what, something is better. Doing something is better than being perfect. Never mind. Just, you know, <laughs> you know forget asset location, but put the money away, you know, so it's there there are uh you know it's just you know me andy i'm sorry there's never like a short simple answer you know it doesn't have to be complicated but it can be very nuanced and the nuances are where the fun is i think helene did you have something to add yeah i was going to add two things which is first um if unless you're a professional like mariko or you do this you write about money professionally like me um, try to avoid all these um, dinners that you get in your in, in, in your mail, <laughs> in your inbox. Please, please, please. Um, these people always sound amazing. Um, I, I'm like Mariko. I like going. I so like going. I will sometimes go if my husband has gotten the invite, and I will go. My husband will not go to these things. And um, you know, they all sound really persuasive. Like I have been in rooms where I swear. I have heard like, you know, REITs where you can't get your money out for like a decade thinking, hmm, should I sign up for this? And I'm like, no. <laughs> so, you know, really like don't go to these things. I, I, I've seriously run into so many people who've signed up for stuff that they've so regretted. Um, you know, and the second is, is what Mariko sort of said is, I mean, the number of people I've interviewed over the years who have you know, just let money sit around for years and years and years because they are afraid of making a mistake um, is is countless. Um, at a certain point, you would be better off with the with the wreath or the money is locked up for 10 years. Um, probably not very often, but occasionally, because there really are people who will just leave their money in savings accounts and not on substantial sums of it, you know, for years and decades sometimes. It's it, it always seems, I, I think one of the things when you deal with money professionally or you're just very interested in it is you take it kind of for granted that you have this knowledge and you have this ability to do X, Y, and Z. And in fact, it's not actually that common. And people really do stuff that is not well advised for reasons that seem actually fairly smart and good to them. I'm just being cautious. You know, I don't want to lose my money. Um, and I bet anything, by the way, the person who had the one, the, the, the uh, investment with less than 2% return had been talked into it by somebody um, because school teachers in particular, they tend to be very targeted by some of these really dubious um, so-called financial advisors. I, I use the phrase there at this point. Um, you know, and I, I think it's something we all have to really remember you know, that people do these things because they do think they're being good. Like, oh, I'm just checking over and over again. Um, and I would say one third thing, and I'm sorry, I'm going on and on and I'm sorry, um, is that you also need to be careful of somebody who comes to you. One of the things I find is people come to me over and over again and ask if there's like some quote safe investment you know, that could definitely keep up with the stock market. And I've had to explain over and over again that that actually doesn't exist. And the really crazy part of this is, is if you actually have a public facing life like I do, is you'll find that it's the same people over and over again who come to you. So like five years later, I'll hear from the same person. Like, do you have a you know suggestion for this? And it's like, but I told you a couple of years ago that this didn't exist. And here's the actual email I wrote to you, you know, at the time. Um, and I think that that's just something we have to all kind of wrap our heads around um, and think of sometimes bit, try to think of better ways to explain this to people. And harness the wishful thinking. Right. Into, into effective action. Right. Like this is what you can do. What I often say is, this is what we know works best, right? We know that putting money in the stock market through broad-based index funds will probably leave you in good shape, right? And that's kind of been the approach I've taken with people over the years. Yeah, I mean, it really begs the question of, you know, a, a big percentage of the population just needs a good financial advisor. Right. I mean, I hate to say it because we know that some of these things are not particularly hard, 
Like it's not really hard when you're 20 years old and you have a little bit of money. It's not hard to figure out what to put that money into if you want to do a little bit of studying. But between the disinterest in doing the studying and the emotionality of the decisions which don't necessarily serve people, it's very clear to me now that a lot of people just need a financial advisor. The problem is finding one that's actually going to help you, right? As opposed to finding one who has ulterior motives. Exactly. Right. That that's that's a really important thing. The the understanding the ecosystem, uh, what the what the incentives are, like why. I mean, it's that that's how to develop the discernment too, mm -hmm. um, and the. I mean, there's so many times I'm I'm you know kind of ashamed of my. <laughs> my industry because there's so many bad actors out there who rationalize all sorts of crazy things and don't think of themselves that way. They're not walking around going, hoo -hoo, I'm like Machiavelli over here. You know, <laughs> I know how to do psyops and remove people from their money, you know? And yet, you know, uh, they do. And um, yeah, it's, yeah, well. Yeah, I think That's the opportunity. And I are the, are the same person here. I always say, Bert, I'm sure Bernie Madoff didn't go to bed thinking he was a bad person, but he was. I, I feel the exact same way. And I want to add that you know one thing the federal government did under the Trump administration, which made it harder, is they kind of mucked up the use of the word fiduciary, so that it's even hard now. We used to be able to tell people, oh, you know, get to somebody who works under the fiduciary standard. And now even that is a hard thing to tell people because the term has been so loosened. I don't want to say it's meaningless, but it definitively does not necessarily get you what you think it's going to get you anymore. And also these sort of credential mills that aren't real. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you're awarded a credential from a for-profit educational institution, <laughs> you know, and you're like, I mean, you get like a bunch of chances, and it's like I don't know, ten video modules, but you get to put some some initials after your name, you know, and and I mean, not to be an elitist snob here, but I mean, damn it, you know, certain credentials mean something. <laughs> You know, and and same with the fiduciary. Like there are people who'd be a certified fiduciary, and I I go and I Google these up. I look these up. <laughs> what does that mean? Oh, there's this nonprofit, this this organization that just got created to then you where they'll you take a class and you'll be certified that you you know you you you're gonna behave. And I'm like, but there's no public record. Who's on the board? And like, what? I mean, you just. It's insane. As I long no as you idea. pay your membership, you can say. Yeah, and the world, the world of, I mean, I hate to also say this because I'm part of this industry, but also the world of podcasts and blogs is not no better, right? You've got a bunch of people who have zero credentials and who are speaking usually about very specified situations that don't necessarily fit the whole audience. And there's no accountability, right? So you can pretty much say whatever you want. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis Dave Ramsey saying a safe withdrawal rate of eight percent is appropriate, you can say whatever you want on these platforms, and yeah. um, a lot of people we're not held to any standards yeah. on it. Well, just for the record, I am a fiduciary. I'm not duly registered. I never get a commission, and I think that Mariko is in the same boat. With that, let's go to segment three. Okay. It has been said that your money has two best friends: time and compound interest. It's not just about how much you invest, but when you start. The earlier, the better. This principle, rooted in the time value of money, highlights that money today is worth more than the same amount in the future due to its potential earning capacity. Imagine investing a small sum early in your life. Over time, this investment doesn't just grow from the initial principle. It expands from the interest earned on both the principle and the accumulated interest. This is the magic of compound interest. Charts in real life scenarios show how even minimal, consistent investments can over decades transform into a significant nest egg. The longer your investment period, the greater the compound growth. This underscores the importance of patience and long-term planning in investing. In essence, the power of compounding lies not just in the amount you invest or the investment vehicle you choose, but in the time you allow your investments to mature. Start early and watch the magic of compounding turn time into your greatest financial ally. So already a few times in this, in this episode, we've talked about 
the importance of time, the advantage to having more time. And I want to ask Helene, like you said that you have daughters who are Sons. in their 20s. <laughs> what advice do you give them? Um, save money now. Um, I mean, you know, it's really important. I mean, as I said before, I mean, it's just the most frustrating thing because this is the time when people are so tempted to spend money um, on things that you don't necessarily truly need because people in their early 20s as a rule, there isn't a lot they need. They're usually not buying a house yet. They don't have kids yet. Uh, they usually don't have huge medical expenses unless they're extraordinarily unlucky, fill in the blank. Um, but there, it's the first time they have money, really, that's not from mom and dad uh, or like some summer job. And so there's this temptation and, you know, that to go out to dinner five nights a week or to travel whatever you can or to just buy clothes. I mean, I'm trying to think of all the stories I've heard over the years. And it, at the same time, you know, there's, a, there's no way to explain when you're 58, you're going to regret this. Like there's literally no way to explain this to a 25 or 26 year old. It, it just doesn't exist. And you, because people who are young as a rule don't see themselves as getting older. Uh, you think time is going to last forever. And it's a very hard thing to really get through. Uh, the other thing I would say to bring up a point from earlier is that got, I think it was touched on briefly by uh, Mariko is that, or Andy, I'm not sure, I'm sorry, but somebody on the left, on the right side of my screen. So it was one of the two of you is that the, um, you know, the temptation of people in their twenties is also, as we've seen repeatedly over and over again, the dot com boom, the meme stock phenomena, the crypto stuff over and over again has been to think they have have a new answer. Like there's something new under the sun and they've figured out this really smart new investment strategy. And all of us old fogies over here, you know, who are talking about index funds and properly diversifying and just saving regularly and, you know, investing on a cost you know, basis and fill in the, you know, fill in the blank. You know, we don't understand. It's different this time. And of course, as the old joke goes, it's never different this time. Um, and so I think these are really hard concepts to get through. And you know, the only way is to just try to instill the habit early. You know, one lucky break a lot of parents have is if your child gets a job in their 20s, they will often take the benefits forms and bring it to mommy and daddy. I have seen this so many times. I have to admit, I did it with my late father-in-law. <laughs> Um, one of my children did it to me. Um, and, you know, that's really an opportunity. I mean, I don't know how much you really need to explain that will be remembered. But I think if you like do something like say you are to invest 10 percent into your 401k, I mean, 15 percent is ideal. But realistically, a lot of people can't afford that. But like if you just insist on 10 percent, you are laying such a fantastic foundational groundwork. Because people tend to like stick with baselines. And I, I'll use myself as my example, as my father-in-law had told me 10%. And years later, when my son came to me without even thinking about it, I went, oh, well, I think he can afford 10%. It was just instinctual to do that. And I think that that's just a really important thing. So moms and dads who are listening to this, please do this. Um, Mariko, you teased us earlier. Regale us with I have your to tell you this story. story. This is such a or great inspire story. Inspire us. And and it's not and it's not the only one I've heard lately, actually. So it's been really inspirational. But this is a, a friend of a friend um, who worked for the public utility. Um, you know, I think started out as a lineman, you know, and made his way up, but this is not like C suite, you know, he was just a regular guy in the field. Uh who um signed up for the pension plan, put in the max that he could, you know, and the company met it. Now, to be fair, pension plans used to be a lot more generous back then. Um, and 
whenever and and you know eventually there'd be more and he'd put in more but he always sort of lived within his means he would throw away the statements he would not did not open a single retirement account statement for decades he would throw them away so he wouldn't look at them and at the end when you know he he got to retirement age he opened up a statement. He was worth two and a half million in investments and somehow there was another 700,000 in cash. So I don't know about the asset allocation piece here, right? right? $3.2 million from putting in the max that he could in the retirement plan and refusing to look at the statement so that he wouldn't tinker with it. He went in the next day and he gave his notice. And this is just a regular guy. And I've, I keep hearing, like, I don't know if this is this I'm in North Carolina, and, you know, right? But I hear these stories about folks who um, just put money aside and let it, didn't touch it, just let it grow and compound. And um, that's where I think certain hacks like automating savings, taking it off the top, uh, so it's and 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 uh, out of sight, out of mind, in a in a good way, um, is is useful. The other thought I just had, actually, I'm one of the, I'm also a hypnotist. I'm a trained hypnotist, and one of the things that we do when somebody has an aversion to something, right, is we distance it, right? So we take the thing that's making you upset and we throw it way out into the future or way back into the past, and we make it really small and we make it silly. And there's a lot of things that we do to remove the charge. And in a way, I think that's what happens to young people and money decisions is it's just too far. Like this is, we're wired to pay attention to what's right in front of us. And I, I just had the thought of, man, maybe I should work on reverse hypnotism <laughs> where you're bringing a future benefit way up right in your face right now in present where you can feel and enjoy what it would be like to have all that money that you put away, right? And, and I, I just like, I just thought, wow. <laughs> anyway, that's so thank you guys. Because that is the challenge. It's, it's, yeah, it's but not that's being able to see the future yeah. that far ahead. Yeah, that's what we do with fears and anxieties and everything. And and that's I think is default what's what's going on. So we need to bring it forward and make it alive and real right now. So the opposite of your spider phobia or when you see the spider, right? So yeah, and I have a, that could be a lot I have, of fun. I have a client with a similar story and he has since passed away so I can speak about it, mm -hmm. but he was a, just a regular guy. He worked a printing press at a newspaper company and I think never had like a six figure salary. It was always like average salary and he just worked really hard, but he invested early, like early in his career, he saved and he started buying company stocks and he would use drip programs and buy company stock in like Procter and Gamble. These are like fortune 500 companies back in the sixties. So by year 2000, by year 2020, he was a multimillionaire and he had no kids and um, his, his family were the beneficiaries of his um, very wise investing, but it really, it was a real example for me to witness that this guy who you would, he was a true millionaire next door. You would never suspect that he was a multimillionaire. Um, but he didn't not enjoy himself. He, in his retirement, he bought a house down in Florida or he bought a condo and he would travel between New Jersey and Florida and he enjoyed his retirement, um, lived a long life, passed away in his 90s, but always invested wisely and um yeah multiple money managers too he didn't stick it all with one he kind of like he, that's how he diversified he had he had multiple managers managing his money and he grew it very uh he, he grew it very well let's move to segment are we on segment four i'm losing count navigating the psychological landscape of long-term investing is as crucial as financial savvy. Emotional biases like fear, greed, and overconfidence can skew decision-making, 
impacting investment strategies. Recognizing these biases is key to overcoming them. Warren Buffett's advice, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful, highlights the importance of counteracting herd behavior and emotional biases. It's about making decisions contrary to market sentiment. Understanding one's psychological profile is vital. Are you prone to herd behavior or loss aversion? Recognizing these tendencies can lead to more rational decisions. Market psychology also influences investment choices. Collective investor sentiment can sway markets, but focusing on long-term goals and maintaining discipline is essential. Financial advisors can play a crucial role in helping investors manage psychological biases, leading to more effective decision-making. Doc G, how do you suggest that people kind of master their emotions and not be their worst enemy when it comes to compound growth and compound interest? I think it's really a time you have to ask yourself those difficult questions. And if you're finding that you cannot stomach the ups and downs in the market, you really need to have a financial advisor who helps you with it. Um, but I also like what I pretty much get from Nick Majuli. He wrote a book called Just Keep Buying. And I, I love the philosophy. The truth of the matter is most markets go up over time. If you just keep buying, especially when you're young, you're going to do just fine. In up markets, you buy. In down markets, you buy. If you just keep buying over long periods of time, that compound interest is going to fix most of your mistakes. And so that's really the key is especially when you're young, especially when compounds, compound interest is on your side, just keep investing. Marika, last time you were here, you talked about needing a fireman mentality or having a firefighter's mentality where when the building's on fire, you have to be willing to run in when everybody else is running away. Yeah, not everyone's wired for that, but but um, you know, and I think that speaks to something that Michael had had spoken to, which is that when you have an asset class that everyone hates, um, that's usually uh, you know an interesting time to to explore and, and do work on it. And I think this is where rebalancing comes in when you have a diversified portfolio in different asset classes, and over the course of a year, some some pieces will really outperform and some will be dogs and uh, taking some of your profits in those, you know, to keep in rebalancing it back, you're reinvesting it in the asset class that's underperformed. Um, you know, usually that asset class, the reasons that cause that asset class to underperform change and there's mean reversion and that asset class starts to do better. I once had uh, an institutional client who would rebalance uh, every I think it was every month that was unusual. Yeah, Most right. institutions would rebalance every, you know, once a year or something, uh, but they would rebalance every month. And I have to tell you, like when we were had a, had a time when we were underperforming relative to our benchmark, you know, it was really great to have money coming in that we could deploy when it was a really good time for us to deploy. And because you do want to buy things when, you know, you want to buy low and sell high. Right? And unfortunately, the times that you you can buy low are usually not the times you feel like buying low. Right? So it was really, I mean, they were very disciplined about rebalancing. And I think, I think um, you know, our, our natural human wiring is we're going to want to put stuff in the stuff that's working. And if you can get excited about putting money where the stuff's not working, <laughs> As long as it's a real asset class, you know, right? not like crypto or Beanie Babies, uh, you know that 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 you get excited when you, you know, find a great pair of shoes and they're forty percent off and you really love them and they look great on you. Like, can we feel that way about about you know asset classes as well? So I think having rebalancing, which is automatic, um, also takes away some of the emotion because then your self-concept is I'm that person who's a disciplined investor. I automatically invest. I, I'm investing all the time. I rebalance once a year. Um, and, and that's because I'm a disciplined investor. And that way, you know, it's, it's part of your self-construct that the things that you do are the things uh, that reflect who you are. Um, and if you can really embed some, you'll have some good investment habits 
and then the psychology piece will become less likely to kind of destabilize you, I think, you know, if you really work on that self-concept. Helene, were you saying earlier that talking about this time is different? I think one of the risks when it comes to this concept of compounding is that there is a real, um, th there's a temptation that people want to compound faster. And that's why when something like crypto comes along and you, you have people entering early in a cycle where they're growing their money exponentially, like in 12 months, suddenly they say, oh, I can compound my money in 12 months. I don't have to wait 30 years. But those who are experienced investors have seen that it tends to be the boring investments that do well in compound. And oftentimes things that go up quickly also come down quickly. Right. I mean, what I would say is, is it's almost the flip side of the person who invests too conservatively, who keeps their money you know, in a savings account or in a 2% interest investment for decades, you know, because they're afraid of making a mistake or they're afraid of the loss. It's the complete opposite side of this, which is the person who thinks they're going to outsmart all of this and that they're going to jumpstart this and they're going to accelerate it. And it's equally as delusional, frankly. Um, Though, of course, there's always some success story out there somewhere. So it gets held up as the exemplar when, in fact, it should be the reason you know it is because it's man bites dog. You know, most people who do this are not going to make money. The vast majority of dot com people lost money. The va it appears to be true as well from what we can tell from the crypto crowd and the mean stock traders. Um, I'm sure it'll take a year or two to really come out. But the other thing I do want to say is that it's really important to just stay focused on the long term. One of the things, because I write about this, I will often hear from people, you know, in 2008 when Lehman crashed or, you know, it, when COVID happened. And the, 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 what I always try to explain to people is not only do you have to sell at the right time, you need to buy back in at the right time. And the chances of you doing both of those things are just about nil. And that's true for professional investors. And that's true for you. And I find that that's one way to actually convince people to stick it out and to work past their fear, because they're even more fearful of making the wrong decision on the other end. And that will that will lead to a it's almost like making paralysis work in, in your in your long-term favor in this case. Just stay put. You're not going to guess it right the second time. You've probably not guessed it right now because it was really the right time to sell three weeks ago, like before this happened. <laughs> so I, I, I do find that that actually kind of works as a way to explain it to people. You've got to guess it right. Um, the stat is, and you will know it better than me, it's, you know, it's an, it's an infinitesimal number of days of the year that account for most of the gains in the stock market. And if you miss those days, you've missed most of the gain for the year. And so pulling in and out is just not a really good idea. And I and find- those days you know, usually, oh, sorry, yeah. Helene. Those things yeah. usually yeah. happen yeah. in the toilet when the market yeah. is just, blood is running in the streets. Mm -hmm. That's when those days happen. Yeah, right. when you're least likely to actually be there. Right. And and like you said, Mariko, I mean, you know, it's instinctual to want to do this. It's it's very instinctual to want to pull out, to want to seek safety and conversely not to invest. And it's just it's just really hard to get people to overcome that fear sometimes. And, you know, yes, it's, you know, paralysis helps sometimes. Um, sometimes working with a financial advisor helps. Sometimes just talking it through with a friend helps. Um you know, but the point is, is that it just needs to be, you know, hammered in. Don't panic. Don't panic. Don't panic. Valuable advice. Let's go to the last segment, segment five. Compound interest can be a double-edged sword, a powerful force in the world of finance that can work for you as an investor or against you as a borrower. For investors, it's the magic that can turn modest savings into a mountain of wealth. Interest is not just earned on your initial investment, but also on the accumulated interest over time, leading to exponential growth. For borrowers, though, 
The same principle can be a pitfall. Here, interest is not just charged on the principal amount, but also on the accumulated interest causing debt to balloon rapidly if not managed wisely. The strategy for investors is clear. Start early, invest consistently, and let time magnify the growth of your investments. For borrowers, the key lies in understanding loan terms, prioritizing the payment of high interest debts, and avoiding unnecessary borrowing to keep the compounding effect in check. So in this last segment, we're talking about that compound interest can actually work against you. So it depends how you're using compound interest. Are you an investor or are you a debtor? Doc G, many doctors, MDs, have significant student loan debt after medical school. In your experience, do they understand? Can they balance the difference between the good debt, the bad debt, and the investing? Well, thankfully, when you come out of medical school, you also have a high income. So you have a high shovel to dig yourself or a a big shovel to dig yourself out of this debt. So, you know, it runs the gamut. And there are now services that help you look at your student loans. And so you can figure out what the best way to pay them off and how quickly you need to do it. Um, So I don't think it's as bleak with some of the professionals like physicians as you would think. I guess what the more bleak portion is it keeps people in medicine who don't want to do it anymore. So there are a lot of people who get burned out in medicine. They don't like their jobs and the debt is the reason they stay in. But the grand majority of physicians find a way to pay off their debt. But it's something they may carry for sometimes years, sometimes decades, depending on who the person is and how quickly they want to pay it off. And as you were saying, the negative compounding can cost them million dollars in millions of dollars in aggregate over time. But it also slows them down from that positive compounding. So it's that doubly edged negative sword that's really hurting them on both sides. Helene, you addressed debt in the index card, like armed with the knowledge of compound interest, how should people prioritize paying off their debt? Um, This is a really good question um, because there's two competing theories, as I'm sure you know, which is the first is, you know, it's best known by the Dave Ramsey term, the snowball method, which is, is you prioritize paying down your smallest debt first and do it smallest to largest. And the idea is, is this will keep you on the, 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 you know, the true path and you will ultimately pay down your, your debt, um, which is good in theory and does seem to have some evidence on its side, though people have only really looked at it in like one or two year periods, not over a longer term. Um, longer term, over the longer term. But, you know, the other issue is, of course, the interest rate. And that doesn't really work if, say, your smallest debt is, say, your student loan, which probably has a much lower interest rate than your credit card. Um, Your student loan, it probably at most is at 8%. And that's probably, you know, and then your credit card is almost certainly over, unless you have a zero interest temporary promotional, uh, is probably over 20%. And so, you know, I'm always arguing with people to try to pay, to find like a like um, a buddy, you know, that you could like an accountability buddy that you could work with, and to go for the larger debt, because I do think that ultimately paying down the money is, the, you know, the debt. I mean, I'm sorry, is the most valuable thing you can do. Um, I do want to say one thing that Harold and I really have found, or both of us have found over the years is the number of people who, you know, will build up fairly substantial emergency funds while still maintaining a not insignificant amount of credit card debt is really shocking. And, you know, the part of the theory seems to be is that they don't want to build up more debt. But on the other hand, at a certain point, it's a very counterproductive strategy. Uh, As I said, this debt is usually growing at fairly significant rates. It is negative compounding. And the quicker you can pay off a car loan, a credit card, you know, anything vaguely high interest. I mean, any debt at all, you know, truthfully, but certainly, you know, the higher interest. Um, Mortgage debt is, I always think, a slightly different issue because like right now, there are huge numbers of people um, sitting on mortgages of 3% or under. And and a good argument could be made for not paying those off entirely for a very long time to come. 
<laughs> for sure. It can be invested better over a longer period. Yeah, exactly. I mean, basically they're paying you to, for, you know, for, you know, to, to, to stay in the house at a certain point. So. Mariko, do you still put on your analyst hat? Like do higher interest rates today, any concern about companies that have a lot of debt on their balance sheet or like the, the amount of leverage in some of the commercial real estate market? Yeah, I think, you know, having grown up in the 70s, right? So I, um, I, I know what the, you know, what, what life was like before the, the 30 year decline in interest rates. And I think, you know, um, money just got so cheap and your return hurdle so low. And, and I think there, there is a reckoning coming. I mean, everyone likes to kick the can down and, you know, lenders don't also want to like have to have to take a hit. So, you know, it doesn't all happen all at once, but there's an awful lot of commercial real estate debt that is going to be coming due in the next three years. Uh, and uh, where the rent rolls didn't make much sense, even at lower interest rates. Uh, they are definitely going to be underwater, and so uh, you know the 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 so yes. And the other thing is, equity investors tend not to be really great credit analysts. So I always look to the bond, the credit guys who are just much more sensitive, the canary in the coal mine around around credit. And for the longest time, you didn't need to have credit chops because you know, it was a rising tide. And I think now like it really pays to pay attention to that. The other thing too, is that with higher rates, you know, um, people are going to start paying attention to float a lot more and trying to hang on to float, which means that they're going to not want to, you know, pass on the money to you or take your money sooner. And so that's another kind of habit from the 70s that kind of went away, uh, where people didn't have to sort of monitor their, their, the, the cost of financing your customers, right? It got, was cheap and immaterial. Now it's starting to be material because you're lending them money effectively for every dollar that they owe you that they haven't paid you, you're lending them money at 5%. So that's money that you, you know, so, so I feel like there's some changes in the cash management of small businesses in their cash management cycle that they need to pay attention to as well um too yeah we've seen some just changes like a back in the day it was like 15 years ago i was looking for companies that had very little debt on their balance sheet but then when you have zero percent interest rates and money so cheap it's very hard to find companies today that don't have debt on their balance sheet. They've all borrowed. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah they and all then want maybe to the pendulum yeah. swings now. Yeah, they all borrowed because it was cheap and how could you not? Right. And um and I do feel like if you have and I, I've seen individuals with that mindset too, but the thing is if you don't have a plan for it, right? You know, borrowing money when you don't have a plan, even if the interest rate is low, is not a great idea, I think. You know, you need to be intentional about your debt. And it's, you know, leverage is a beautiful, properly deployed, a really beautiful thing. Um, but it needs to be properly deployed. And uh, I think for a lot of people, it just was so cheap. It just didn't matter. And now it's suddenly starting to matter a lot. Doc G or Helene, any final thought? Compounding is good. Keep on using it. Put your money away. Invest it simply and easily and don't touch it. Yeah. I, I always say save, put money in a low cost index fund. Don't think about it potentially for decades. Yeah. Yeah. Mattress money. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I would add is on the debt piece. If you can also see what's the compounding in your, in your debt, then I think it, because you think, oh, I just, you know, I don't know, I have $500 on my credit card, but you're not actually seeing that that $500 is turning into 750, you know, oh, oh, I don't know, in about two and a half months or something, right? I mean, so I think that's the other thing is when you actually see that, I think that 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 seeing it can be a, a, a reality call, you know, a wake up call mm -hmm. as well. So I think the power of compounding, let's bring those million dollar returns forward Right. And then let's also look at the pushing out of the, the debt 
forward and um, hopefully that that brings um, better better habits um, to, to do that. Get scared and long on your investments. Yeah. We covered a lot today. We had great stories. I'll just do three quick takeaways. Number one, the power of patience and time in wealth accumulation. The transformative nature of compound interest has been called the eighth wonder of the world. So the key takeaway here is that allowing your investments to grow over time through the magic of compounding can turn even a modest savings into something more substantial. And then patience becomes a crucial element in the journey toward financial security and prosperity. Number two, diverse investment vehicles can utilize compound interest. So compound interest applies to a variety of investments from stocks to bonds, to retirement accounts like IRAs and 401ks to taxable accounts. Each vehicle plays a unique role in harnessing the power of compound interest, guiding individuals toward financial freedom and security. And then finally, timing matters. Start early for greater wealth. The earlier you start, the greater the compound growth. And the key takeaway here is the importance of patience and long-term planning as even minimal, consistent investments made early in life over decades can transform into a significant nest egg. So I want to thank our panelists today. Please follow them. You can find Helene Olin at HeleneOlin.com. Jordan Dokji Grummet is at EarnAndInvest.com. And Mariko Gordon, you can find her at MarikoGordon.com. And Michael Gayed, who had to leave us early, you can find him on Twitter where he has something like 750,000 followers, but you can find him at Lead Lag Report. So thank you everyone for listening and watching this episode about compound investing. Next week, we have episode 16, Investing in Your Health, the Intersection of Wellness and Wealth. I think that one of the panelists will be Mike Taylor, who is a hedge fund manager and portfolio manager of the Pink ETF that donates its net profits in the form of its annual management fee to the Susan G. Komen Breast Cancer Foundation. He's going to be a panelist. And as Mike says, the hardest part about wealth is lasting to enjoy it. So please join us Wednesday. That's December 6th at 6 p.m. Eastern. Until next time, do something that scares you because that's where the magic happens. And don't forget to invest early and often.